I speak to you today in the name of one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. So I would like to again start this week by acknowledging a debt of gratitude to Dr. Alan T. Farnes, whose brilliant and scholarly work on these parables have led to the foundation and set the tone for both today's sermon and last sermon. So we have him to thank for, or perhaps even blame, I don't know. For those of you who may not have been present last week, we made the argument that when we look at chapters 15 and 16 in Luke's gospel, we can find a comprehensive lesson that's dependent upon combining five parables into a continuous narrative or story, each parable building off of the last one. We began this argument with the parables of the lost sheep and the lost coin, which I believe lay the foundation for the two lessons that Jesus wants us to take away today. In the parable of the lost sheep, you might remember, we saw how God pl places an immense amount of value and joy in people. The shepherd in the parable leaves behind the safety of his flock and goes into the wilderness to seek after that one lost sheep. This again is meant to show just how much God values us. It's meant to show how God values and loves people. In the parable of the lost coin, we saw a different story. In this parable, we, we get a picture of a person who places an immense amount of value and, and joy in wealth. The woman in the parable finds her lost coin and throws an extravagant and expensive party after she finds that lost coin. And this parable, I'm suggesting, is meant to represent those who value wealth above all things. These lessons then lay the foundation again for, for how we will understand the next three parables in this cluster. Those parables are the prodigal son, the unjust manager, and lastly, our parable from today's gospel lesson, the rich man and Lazarus. And last week, we argued that the most compelling evidence that this five-parable cluster is meant to be kind of understood as a unit is that the characters are the same in the last three parables. And so let's break that last part down. The younger brother and the father from the prodigal son parable, I am saying, are the same people as the unjust manager and the rich man from last week's gospel. In his paper, Farnes suggests that there are some similarities in the characters that help us come to these conclusions. For instance, the prodigal son and unjust manager both squandered someone else's money they, these, by the way, were the only two times that the word squandered was used in Luke's gospel. Each of those characters had an epiphany moment in the hopes of securing a better life for themselves. They each then devised a plan and, won, and, then, and then took action to try and gain future security. Neither the prodigal son or the unjust manager exactly repented. However... Each one is offered forgiveness and acceptance. I'm trying to catch you all up for this week, by the way. Also, we would do well, I think, to point out that in the parable of the prodigal son, the father forgives his son because he values and loves him much more than wealth. And if those are the same characters, it stands to reason that this logic holds up. And last week, in the unjust manager parable, the, the manager, or prodigal son, is again forgiven. Because just as all those years before, his father, who, who is now his boss, values and loves him much more than wealth. There's a theory that when the unjust manager was cutting debts in last week's gospel lesson, what he was actually doing was forfeiting his own share of the profits so that he could make friends. In other words, he was valuing people, which is a lesson that his father, who is known for loving people more than wealth, would want him to learn. 
All of that, by the way, is arguably, I think, a hat tip to the first two parables in the cluster then, uh, uh, the parable of the lost sheep and the parable of the lost coin, or the arguments, what do you value, people or wealth? Simply put, we're talking about the story of a particular father offering his son love and forgiveness because he values him and wealth, because he loves and values him more than he could possibly Imagine. And now that we're all caught up, let's move on to our gospel lesson and the, the fifth and final parable in the cluster today, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Our gospel lesson today is the old role reversal in the afterlife. It's Lazarus who suffered greatly in the parable, Lazarus who may even represent the suffering of all of humankind, Lazarus whose name literally means God has helped. And here's the thing that I think starts to tie things together for us. Not only does Father Abraham know Lazarus' name, but someone else knows his name too. If you were to look at verse 24 in the 16th chapter of Luke, you would see that the rich man says, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. The rich man knows Lazarus' name. But how? You know, at first in the parable, it may have appeared that, that he may have even been unaware of Lazarus' suffering. It didn't seem connected, but... The fact that he knows Lazarus' name proves that he wasn't oblivious. In fact, it proves that he knew Lazarus. And I don't think they just went to high school together. I believe in reality it was because of the rich man that Lazarus was suffering. So how might they know each other? Well, let's take a moment and imagine, if you will, the embittered older brother at the end of the prodigal son's parable. Not going into the party, fuming. Some years pass. His younger brother's been working, managing their father's affairs, and then, bam, he catches his younger brother once again taking advantage of their father. So he goes and he tells on him, like any brother might do, the father then calls in the prodigal son, that no good manager for questioning. But, but what happens? Dad forgives him again. Will the injustice ever end? Well, just you wait, because someday, come hell or high water, it will. Now imagine again, if you will, more years pass. Eventually, the father dies. And remember, remember... At the end of the prodigal son parable, all that the father had left belonged to the older brother. And so, the moment he was able, the very moment their father died, the very moment the older brother became the master of the house, the moment that he became the rich man in these stories, he calls his younger brother, the prodigal son, that no good, unjust manager, that no good Lazarus. He takes back the purple robe and the ring that, had fought, that his father had given to that inheritance squandering brother all those years ago. And then he kicks his worthless brother to the curb. And now old Lazarus is getting his. And again, that's where we pick things up now this week. We're sitting with the older brother from the parable of the prodigal son at a feast, for one. He's wearing that purple robe that his father once gave to his brother, that robe that was rightfully his to begin with. And he's selfishly enjoying his dead father's wealth, feasting by himself every day. His deadbeat brother, well, he's laying at the gate outside, hungry, alone, begging, full of sores. You might remember in the prodigal son story when, when he had blown his share of the inheritance and was in need, he longed to fill his belly 
with the pods that the pigs were eating. And here he is once again, poor old prodigal Lazarus, longing to fill his belly with the scraps that fell from the table of a different kind of pig. The kind of pig that would never be satisfied. The kind of pig that would rather watch mountains of food rot on the table than share with his poor starving brother. But God's justice is coming. Both men die and their roles are reversed. Now Lazarus has been taken up and is being comforted by Father Abraham while his brother, the rich man, begs for Father Abraham to send Lazarus so that he can warn the rest of the family of what awaits if they don't start valuing people over wealth. Abraham simply replies, they have Moses and the prophets, they should listen to them. The rich man responds, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. Abraham disagrees. It won't work, not even if someone rises from the dead, but why would he say that? I think we need to ask ourselves, has there ever been an instance in in this parable cluster where someone was raised from the dead, yet yet one of the other characters did not have a change of heart. Well, if you did your homework, you would have read in Luke chapter 6, or 15, I think that's 15, in Luke chapter 15 and 16, at the end of the parable of the prodigal son, the father speaking to the embittered older brother said, but we had to celebrate and rejoice. Because this brother of yours was dead and has come back to life. He was lost and has been found. All right. So I'd like to bring us back to this idea that there are two different lessons going on here for two different groups of people. Now to draw these lessons out, we need to remember who Jesus' audience is is for the parables. That is to say, we need to ask the question, who was Jesus talking to? Well, tax collectors and sinners, and then Pharisees. Easy enough then, I think. The first message was for people identified as the tax collectors and the sinners. In other words, in my opinion, I I think all of the lay people who were present there. And that message, I believe, was pretty simple. And it's this, you are not alone, and God loves you and values you more than you can possibly imagine, and you are worthy of dignity and respect and grace and mercy and love and life. So come home. Come home to God's open arms. Because there's going to be a party. And once you're home and the party's over and you get to work, you're doing your day-to-day and eventually you mess up because we all mess up, well, you are not alone. And God loves you and values you more than you can possibly imagine. And you are worthy of dignity and respect and grace and mercy and love and life. And it's going to be okay. And even if the worst happens and people treat you badly and and you end up losing everything and find yourself begging on the streets, well, take heart. There will be justice. God will leave the flock behind to come find you and bring you home, right where you belong. The second message was then, of course, for the Pharisees. 
the religious elite. They didn't value the same thing that God values. They financially exploited God's people for their own gain while pronouncing judgment and condemnation upon all who were unable to live up to their unrealistic expectations and standards of religious law. And God's message for them was equally clear. Hell awaits. Now, I want to be really clear on this point because I don't want anyone calling the bishop and saying that Father Ken's up here preaching fire and brimstone. I'm not preaching fire and brimstone from the pulpit. I'm pre preaching fire and brimstone to the pulpit. And here's what I mean by that. While Jesus usually lets his parables speak for themselves, here he actually gives us his own personal commentary. In other words, there's no mistaking the meaning. In the middle of the last two parables of this cluster, Jesus says, you cannot serve both God and wealth. And I think that right here it's obvious who Jesus was talking to. He was talking to the Pharisees. He was talking to those who were ordained and charged with caring for God's people. Someone once told me that they disagreed with this verse, the verse about not being able to serve both God and wealth. This was a very wealthy person. My answer to him was, what makes you think it's about you? Because I think that Jesus was talking about me. The line, you cannot serve both God and wealth, is a message to every ordained person and professional religious type. We're called to care and value people, not wealth. And if all that wasn't convincing enough, Luke 16, 14, which falls right in between last week's parable and this week's parable, reads, the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard all this, and they ridiculed him. I feel like I should, like, mic drop there or something. I'm almost done, though, I promise. What's really unfortunate is, is that I have to stand up here and say that not a lot has changed. Because perhaps now, more than ever, there are those in leadership positions in churches who value wealth more than people. So-called pastors preying on their congregations, exploiting the poor for personal gain. They're more or less stealing from people who in reality can't afford to give. Telling them if they have faith and give anyway, well, God will bless you. And we in the church need to be better at calling this out. Priests, pastors, ministers, we cannot serve God and wealth. Because serving wealth is all-consuming. When a pastor tries to serve wealth, their relationship with God fails, and they become a leech, sucking the life out of the church. But while the chasm from our parable today, the chasm that separated the named from the nameless, the, the chasm that separated the comforted from the suffering, was uncrossable, the imagined chasms that we place between ourselves and the people suffering around us in this life are not. And if we focus on and value God's people the way that God intends for us to, well, that becomes a party. It's a party of rejoicing every single time that someone decides to stop worrying about whether they're good enough or, or worthy enough or they believe enough or they have faith enough or, or they act the right way or they say the right things or if they wear the right clothes and they just come home to Jesus. Yes, we can cross the imagined chasms that separate us from each other and that separate us from the poor and the suffering and the nameless and the heartbroken. And we can say to each other just as easily as I am about to say to you right now, come home. 
just come. You are not alone. God loves you and values you more than you could possibly imagine. And you are worthy of dignity and respect and grace and mercy and love and life. So just come home. Come home to God's open arms. Because there's going to be a party. And once you're home and the party's over and you get to work and eventually you mess up because, well, we all mess up. Well, God loves you and values you more than you could possibly possibly imagine. And you are worthy of dignity and respect and grace and mercy and love and life. And it's going to be okay because you are not alone. You were never 